Hello and welcome to the Cardiac Cats YouTube channel. I'm your host, Jacob Shorba, and today we're going to be recapping week one of the 2024 NFL season for your Jacksonville Jaguars as they fell to the Miami Dolphins. Close game, was not close the whole way through, but sure as heck allowed it to be late. And so we're going to break this down. We're going to talk about individual players, going to talk about this team in general. You know, obviously we're going to talk about a lot of concerns because the way they lost was pretty disgusting. There's there's no other way to put it, right? It's something that you just don't think should happen, but it's also a team that blew a 99% chance to make the playoffs last year. So they got to figure it out. But we're going to go through that. We're going to check out PFF grading as well from this game. That's why I waited until the day to get this out because we just got information this morning from them. So that's what we'll be talking about. Um, I also want to let you guys know that later this week, hopefully sooner rather than later, I plan to start a film breakdown series. So we'll go through one player each week, talk about them, try to watch some film on them, just how are they performing. I want to probably focus more on some of the younger guys, right? The guys that we don't know as well. You know, for example, talking about the defensive line, the first guy we'll talk about is Trayvon Walker, which will be a very controversial subject uh, just based off the, the two different sides that you get in the conversation with one being that he's this incredible player, one being that he's not even average. And I think it's somewhere in the middle, right? We'll talk more about that when we do it. But Trayvon Walker is a player that's developing. He's, he's a player that you don't know as well as a Joshua Hines Allen and Eric Armstead, someone that's been in the league for a longer time. So we're going to focus on younger guys when we do that series, which should be pretty fun and something exciting to do this year. Now, getting into this actual game, getting into the performances by this team. So 20-17 to 17 loss, you see pretty clearly Jacksonville held the lead early, and this game looked like it was going to get put away, right? Travis Etienne running down to the goal line, going up 24-7, to 7, ends up fumbling the ball. We'll talk quite a bit about that, but it was a big turning point in this contest, and two plays later... You know, Miami goes from going down 24 to 7 to all of a sudden it's 17 to 14. Jacksonville doesn't have answers and, you know, didn't really do anything after that point. They had opportunities, nothing happened. But getting into some of the individual stats, you know, low volume passing day for Trevor Lawrence. 12 out of 21, 162 yards, one touchdown. I believe most of this, I would have to believe most of this, came in the first half of the game. And really started to die down later on. Did not have much of a passing attack. This offense has felt very on and off, right? We've had moments where it looks like they just can't be stopped. They're going 20 yards a play down the field. And then you get moments where it's 4th and 24 and you're punting. So, very interesting uh, from Trevor Lawrence. But I guess something we've seen a little bit of in the past. You've also got Tank Bigsby who led the team. In yardage, also tied Travis Etienne and carries. Kind of a wild stat there that, you know, I thought he was going to get involved, but didn't know it was going to be at that extent. And then Gabe Davis was your receiving leader with 62 yards. Not really a big day for any Jaguars wide receiver in terms of volume, but I do think it was a very impressive day for one of them that we'll surely talk about. So getting into player stats. We'll talk about Trevor Lawrence here for a little bit. One of the things that... I have wanted him to do for a while that we just haven't got. And I think was kind of shown in this game is I want to see him be a dual threat quarterback, right? I'm not talking about a thousand yards rushing. I'm not talking about just being this dominant on the ground guy, but this guy's got legs, right? We, we knew that from college film. We've seen him with Clemson. We know he can do that yet. It just seems like it's never an option. It's very rarely an option. And he did rush at least a little bit in this game, uh, actually one time, for eight yards, it was a good rush, right? Every time you see him do it, usually pans out pretty well. And so I want to see more of that because there were opportunities, especially late in this game, for him to scramble, for him to get out of the pocket and maybe get some yardage on the ground, you know, just to do something. But it feels like Lawrence has been very heavily a pocket passer. And not that that's the worst thing in the world, but this is a guy who can threaten with his legs. You know, that's something I, I wish we had more of. I'm not really blaming Lawrence as much for that as I am, you know, the team seemingly coaching him not to do that that much. 
It doesn't seem like it's it's ever really talked about. And so, you know, that was kind of a disappointment for me, but something that has been a trend for quite a while. But for Trevor Lawrence, you know, it's not a bad day. It's not a day that you're looking at and saying, this guy is the problem. But I do want to say that I have concern about how he has played in a lot of key moments recently. Going back to last year, we hear a lot from this team about urgency. We hear that word quite a bit. And for how much they say urgency, how much they talk about needing it, this has got to be one of the least urgent teams I have ever watched. I'm not just talking about this game. I'm talking back to last year, specifically at the end of the season. It's like they have no concept that the game is going to be over if you don't convert here, right? Or if you don't get this first down, the other team's getting the ball, and they're probably going to score, and you're going to lose. And it just felt like with Trevor, you know, the final drive specifically was probably the, the biggest issue in this game for him. And we won't just talk negative. I got some good things to say too. But, you know, I, I rewatched the three plays they had because he had the run – that went nowhere, of course. You had the two passes after that, or at least, you know, supposed to be passes. The first one, he's sitting in the pocket, and he's got pressure coming in, and could easily scramble, but doesn't do it. You know, decides against it. Same thing the second time. And so, I don't really understand why we're not okay moving out of the pocket. I don't understand why we're not aware of our surroundings in that kind of a situation late in the game, it feels like his pocket awareness has had issues throughout his career. Not all the time, but you've seen issues very clearly. And this was an example of it. And it's frustrating, you know, to come off a season where the last play of the year, I don't know if I'd call it throwing it away, but Trevor completely missed his target on the final play of the season. I get he was hurt. I understand that. You know, and we can have a lot of excuses for him that are very valid. But you see things like that. And then you see this game where he's just getting sacked at the end, and he has an opportunity to roll out. There's a way to go do something. Like, you have to make a play, or at least try. I'm not encouraging him to go do something incredibly stupid, right? Throwing an interception could have been worse. Obviously, still ended with the Dolphins winning, but you got to try to do something especially as a $55 million quarterback. And that was a frustrating thing out of this game was just watching the end of it and how they really just didn't even come close to challenging on the final drive. You know, this feels like a team that's like everyone's looking at each other and they want someone else to step up and no one's willing to do it. So it's it, it's frustrating. You're going to hear a lot of that phrase today. But, you know, that's kind of the bad side here. But, man, at the same time, you see special stuff from Trevor Lawrence. You can't deny it. I think the best play of this game was undoubtedly his throw to Brian Thomas Jr., his first touchdown that he's ever got. You know, the anticipation to throw it before he's even open. He's got three guys around him, and Trevor has the trust in Brian Thomas Jr. to bring that in. I thought that was a phenomenal moment for this team, and, and getting to Brian Thomas Jr. here and, and talking more about him, Man, he looks ahead of schedule. The way he's playing right now, the level he's competing at, I understand, like, he didn't get the ball in the second half. He didn't have, like, this 100-yard day. But he looks really freaking good. This is a guy who's learning how to run routes well. He's, he's become more nuanced in his time. He's explosive. His cuts are phenomenal. I, I don't know how you're going to cover him after so long. I mean, once he really gets things down, and I think for this team to really flip the script of the season from a continuation of the late 2023 season, I think they're going to have to rely on Brian Thomas Jr. more. And I think he's ready. You know, if you go back to when he was drafted, I had said at the time that I felt like he was a player we need to have patience with, right? That's probably not going to be ready year one. I think I was wrong when I said that. I think he's ahead of schedule. And... You know, one thing that was really nice to see from him, too, you know, for being what seems to be a shy guy or a quiet guy, you know, chirping at Jalen Ramsey. Start of the game, getting right into it with him. You make no doubt about it, right? He's a competitor on the field. And so I love that with Brian Thomas Jr. I'm pretty blown away 
from what we've seen so far. Of course, this is early in the season. We have not seen, you know, a whole body of work yet. But what we've seen so far is really, really good from Brian Thomas Jr. And I think that's got to be a huge part of what they're doing. And I think that's that's how you get Trevor Lawrence to, to be that dominant quarterback that you want him to be. I would be focusing more on getting plays designed to Brian Thomas Jr. So great stuff there from him. Now, with the rest of the receiving core, I was a little disappointed with the uses of sorry, the usage of Parker Washington. Only seven snaps on the day, shockingly. And, you know, had a three yard reception. But it just felt like he wasn't really a part of things. And while I understand that he is a backup, right? He is not a starter right now, and it wouldn't make sense for him to be a starter, I think that's a player you want to get involved. I think you want to take advantage of that, especially knowing that despite his size, like he's able to line up all over the field. He's able to play out wide, get your guys a little bit of rest, get a rotation going. I think you're going to be better off for that because you got four really good players you can put on the field. Now, talking about Christian Kirk for a moment, you know, had one reception for 30 yards, good play, but also had some drops, had some really bad moments in this game. And obviously, like, During the preseason, it was mentioned that he was hurt. He had an injury, and apparently he's fully recovered from it. I assume he has, but it was was a rough start to the season for Christian Kirk, and we'll have to see what happens. You know, technically last year, he had a pretty bad start too. I think he had like nine yards receiving the first game, but he was on track for his career high in receiving yards that season. He He had a good year coming until the injury. So I went right off Kirk yet. But I do think we got to see more from him. It was a rough start to the season, and we'll have to see where it goes from here. Now, getting to the rushing attack. This is where things get really interesting, because no one would have told you, going into week one, that Tank Bigsby would be the leading rusher. And not only that, but he'd be getting over two yards more a carry than what Travis Etienne is. But that is the case. Talking about what Bigsby's done in the run game, he looks like a completely different player. I think the best word to describe what's changed in his game is decisiveness. This is a guy that when he's getting the ball, he knows where he's going with the ball, right? And you want to have a good balance because obviously being hesitant and waiting for lanes to open doesn't always work out. You get hit in the backfield sometimes. When you come down too fast, you might miss out on lanes. But Tank Bigsby, not a whole lot to complain about there because He's got 73 yards on 12 carries. He's bouncing outside, getting first downs from first and 10, playing well. This was a phenomenal game from him. And I think it makes you feel better about if there is an injury at some point to Travis Etienne. I think you do have a really good insurance policy on this team, and I think you could survive. Not ideal, of course, but... You know, Tank Bigsby, I think, is a really good running back. I think he's proven that during the preseason, during training camp, and during this first game, and hopefully things stay on the course that they are. Now, with Travis Etienne, obviously a rough day. Ended up fumbling, going into the end zone, turned around the entire game. Now, what I want to note with that, that I think is important, two things. One, don't blame the 14 points on him completely. That swing, right? Because you go from scoring a touchdown to giving up a touchdown. The defense blew the play against Tyreek Hill too. And it wasn't terrible, right? It's Tyreek Hill. He's fast. And they figured that out the hard way. And they were close to tackling him. But that's not Tank, sorry, that's not Travis Etienne's fault, right? We need to stick solely to the fumble. And, you know, what the defense did is what the defense did. But that fumble, I got to tell you, like, you go watch the replay of it. That's all Javon Holland. Miami's safety. He's going to get paid a lot of money here soon, I'm sure, whether it's during the season or in the off season, he's a phenomenal player. And if you go look at the replay, the hit he put on the ball was as good as it gets. I don't know how anyone's holding on to that ball. So, you know, very impressive play by him. I think it's more about the credit that he deserves for making the play rather than Travis Etienne being this massive issue. But I also want to say with Travis Etienne, you know, that was not the only issue during the game. Wasn't getting a ton of yards on the ground. You know, obviously split carries in this game, but he just didn't seem like he was always going to the right place. 
who was always making the right decisions. And so I'd probably say, you know, this is not your normal game. This is not the end of Travis Etienne. For the people who think Tank Bigsby is taking over this backfield, I highly doubt that. I think it's going to be both of them going. I think they're both good players. I think Travis Etienne's better, but I don't think this is a situation where Travis Etienne is, like, washed and, you know, Tank Bigsby is going to be RB1 the rest of the year. Don't think that's super realistic. Now, talking about offensive line before we get to the defensive side of the ball, we'll kind of peek at our uh, our grades here. Go to blocking. So, looking at pass blocking for this team, this is where they're graded out a lot higher. Cam Robinson ends up having the highest grade, but I'm not sure how much stock I'm putting into this at this point. If we go look at Cam Robinson throughout his career, especially recently, just high pass blocking grades all the time, but we've watched him, right? He's not a terrible player by any means, but he has some pretty bad snaps in there too. And the worst one of the game was definitely the fourth and one attempt, which, you know, stealing notes from later, but why in the hell are you running it on fourth and one up 17 to 14 on your side of the field when you have no momentum? Like, what's the logic? There's none. But Cam Robinson on that play completely blew his block. That was a big reason why there were people ready to get after Travis Etienne. I still don't think they would have converted it per se, but that was a huge factor on that play and a big reason why it was essentially blew up. Also had a penalty during the game. So the pass blocking grade, I'm not I'm not this high on him. I don't think he had that great of a day. And for both tackles, I don't think they were that impressive in run blocking. And Cam Robinson really isn't the worst player to note here. Anton Harrison, as much love as we give him, worst day he's ever had, I think, as a pro. He gave up two sacks. There were just plays where it looked like he wasn't even moving. You know, he just kind of stood in place, and guys are running by him. I mean, Jalen Phillips, he had a day against him. And Jalen Phillips is a good player. I'm not taking anything away from him, but you don't give up this amount of sacks in the game. You don't play like this. This isn't how it's supposed to go. And so, hopefully for Anton Harrison, this is the one-off. I would lean towards that being the case. I don't think he's just all of a sudden a bad football player. But, I mean, we could check 2023 as far as grades, but still, by the eye test, I'd say it's the worst. And they do have it clearly as the worst on here. So, stuff to work on for Anton Harrison, not the way you wanted to start the season. The other guys, though, you know, Ezra Cleveland had a fine day. You know, did fine in pass protection. Apparently did give up a sack. I didn't really see that on film, but obviously it would have happened. And Brandon Scherf and uh, Mitch Morse, fine days as well. Morse, I think, probably got a lower grade than what he should have. I don't think he was terrible. But you still have this problem on the interior with run block, right? And with the tackles as well. I got to throw them in there too because it's not just the interior of this offensive line. This is not a good run blocking team at all. This is a really bad team in that regard. And, you know, we could go through the whole history for the Jaguars. I'll actually show you that really quick to make this point here. But right now, you look at the best teams in run blocking. 28th of 30, waiting on the 49ers and Jets to play, of course. In pass protection, better grade at least, ranking 17th of 30. So, I mean, still 64.8. That is above average, but at the same time, you got the Cam Robinson grade in there that I don't think is very accurate. But this is kind of what the team's been for a long time. You know, we go back and we look at run blocking grades for previous years. Go back to 2023, how bad they were. Second worst team, 2022. Go back to run blocking. Third worst team, technically tied for second worst. 2021, they are the fifth worst run blocking team. That's before Doug Peterson even got here. That's Urban Meyer's year. And then back to 2020, I'll stop here, but eighth worst run blocking team. It has gotten worse and worse and worse and worse every year. And we've talked about it on this channel for a long time. And I, I didn't want to make this whole video about it because you've heard plenty from me about what I think about the offensive line. But it's got to change, right? At some point, you can't just pretend it doesn't exist. You can't just go out to a press conference and talk about 
how you're missing this stuff from your trench play, and then make one acquisition who's not even like this high-end starter. No offense to Mitch Morse, right? Like, he's a veteran. He's an older player. He's not the same guy he used to be. But just to do that and then say, oh, everything's fine, just didn't feel like it was ever going to work out, unfortunately. And so not really a great start to the year, I think, for this offensive line. But we'll have to see where things go from here. Now, getting back to our grades here for down the road, we'll, we'll start talking about our, uh, our defense a little bit. I want to shout out, first of all, Devin Lloyd. Best game that he has had in his career in coverage. Phenomenal day from him. 87.8 in coverage. 81.8 as a tackler. 69.1 as a pass rusher. And this is something that we have not seen a lot from him in his NFL career. But you can go back to college. And Devin Lloyd was a dominant pass rusher for Utah. That was a huge thing with his game. In his NFL career, he's only got one sack, which is crazy. But we take this back to his college career in 2021. I think he had 10 sacks that year. Or sorry, eight. I mean, he was good. Right? So it was nice to see Devin Lloyd have such a good day, especially in an area where he hasn't really been that good throughout his career, just in coverage. You see 2022 graded out really bad. 32.4 in coverage. Now, did have three picks. He had the really good start to his career, but not a great way to, to end the season. You know, was struggling, obviously, um, more with the mental processing of the game in 2022. But every year, this guy gets better, right? I think Devin Lloyd is one of these players that we see either this next offseason after his fifth-year options accepted or maybe another year down the road get top-of-the-market linebacker money. I would not be shocked. He's a damn good player. And I I still can't believe that they had him listed as an or on the depth chart with Chad Muma. And by the way, just for reference on how that turned out, 53 snaps for Devin Lloyd, 10 for Chad Muma. So huge difference there. Foyasad Aluakon also had a phenomenal day. Pretty much good in every aspect of the game, but dominant in coverage. This linebacker core looks phenomenal. Really good unit. Yasir Abdullah, one I actually didn't look too much at. 16 snaps, but ended up having a really good grade. That was impressive. Um, You see here with Chad Muma, 10 snaps on the day. Now, getting into notes for the defensive line, we'll kind of work there, and then we'll go into the secondary. So, Josh Allen, curious what people think on that. I have not got to watch him a ton since the end of the game, but we heard this offseason that Josh Allen put on a ton of weight. Sorry, I'm calling him Josh Allen, not Josh Hines Allen. Um, just for the sake of of what's normal to me. But Josh Allen, to me, you know, playing at 285 now, putting on this weight, just didn't feel like he was as fast on the field. I'm a little concerned about that. He ended up having an okay day. Not that he was bad necessarily, but, you know, two pressures on the day. That, that's okay. It's not what you're expecting necessarily, but it just felt like he really struggled with moving as fast as he was last year. Maybe I'm wrong on that. But you know, I saw plays where he's trying to get to the quarterback, and when he's changing direction, chasing him down, it's like he has to come to a stop now. It has me a bit concerned with him. And we know like they wanted to put on a lot of weight for some of these players on the edge because they wanted to play all over the defensive line. That was something that was mentioned to us in one of the interviews from Josh Allen. But overall, you look at his snaps across this defensive line, he didn't move inside one time, which is interesting. Because it doesn't seem like we really fully understood what was going on there. And I'm about 99.9% sure Josh Allen was the one that said they might play inside a little bit. But overall, you know, okay day, not what you're looking for. But I have a little bit of concern with him, and I'll probably be watching him closely going forward. Now, Eric Armstead, they ended up not really grading him out super well. I thought he had a good game. He had a really impressive play on his sack. Just looks explosive, right? Looks like a different breed of player for the Jaguars. You just don't see this kind of stuff on the interior of of this defensive line. 
you know, no disrespect to Devon Hamilton, but Eric Armstead is a phenomenal player. And so the key question is obviously going to be the health, right? Is he going to stay healthy all year? Is he going to be in all season? And hopefully he does, because if he does, he's going to be really good. Now, you can see snap counts didn't get on the field a ton. And I don't even know if he played half the snaps, actually. It doesn't appear so, because, you know, Darby's on the field for 70, and you got Eric Armstead out for 31, so that would have to confirm that. But I thought Armstead did have a pretty good day for Jacksonville. Now, the interesting conversation that I'm not going to go too far into depth now, because I do want to save some of the stuff for the film study when we do it. But Trayvon Walker. So two things can be true here. One, when I watched the film on him, I, I just rewatched the entire game and I only watched Trayvon Walker. Compared to what was said about him, compared to the stat line, and where I expect him to be and want him to be for year three, I do not think he is where he needs to be. I think that the way he's playing right now, there's not a whole lot of variance to what he's doing. He's been almost exclusively a power rusher. I think there was one play during my review where I saw a swim move, of which he almost got taken down at the ground because he didn't really attempt it the right way and got off balance doing it. And there was only one play where he threatened to the inside of the tackle. And so when you do that, when you're trying to win around the edge every play, and you're only trying to win with power, you become very predictable. And for all the talent that he has, the physical gifts, it, it really hurts him as a player. And so, yes, he got two sacks in the game. I think it's important to note that one of those sacks was essentially to a diving to the ground and Trayvon Walker just tapping him, of which Walker didn't really even have a pressure on that play. They don't even account for the pressure or the sack on here. The other one was really impressive. I'm not going to take that away from you, right? Blew up the tackle with power, ended up getting a hold of Tua and took him down to the ground, more tripping him, but that's okay, right? Phenomenal play, took him out of field goal range, key moment in the game. Wish it would have won the game for the team. Now, going back to two things can be true, that's one side of it, right? I don't think that he is this superstar player, right? The other side of it is that I think how he's grayed out on here is ridiculous. I do not look at Trayvon Walker as some below average player like they infer he is every single season. The only thing he has ever had a positive grade in, which given 60 is average on here, is coverage from year one, which they don't give a crap about. He's a 272-pound guy. It's not like he's going to be dropping in coverage all the time, or that's ideally where you want him. They have never given him a positive grade for a single season where there's clearly areas where I think he's at least average, but I do think there's a bias with PFF. Not to say that this is all full of crap, but sometimes it just feels personal. You go watch their shows, and I guess these guys are, I think now on the 33rd team, I think it was Brad and Sam. Every time you watch him, just ripping the guy to shreds. Talking about how terrible he is. The way people talk about him, it's as if he doesn't even belong in the league. And so I'm in the spot, personally, where I'm in, I'm in the middle, right? I don't think he's a superstar. I also think he's, he's worthy of playing in the NFL. But we got to see more, right? It's great to have two sacks. Boy, I, I want people to understand is the most important thing when you're evaluating a player is considering not necessarily what they've done, but what are they going to do for you in the future, right? Unless it won you a Super Bowl, you can go reminisce on that, right? But all of these things matter. Like, we're going to talk about these two sacks as if they're important if that means, hey, Trayvon's going to keep doing it, right? And so you want to see evidence in those plays of a way that he can continue to win. And so far, I think we've seen a lot of the same stuff. A lot of it's power. There were plays where it just didn't even seem like he really won the rep, where he still got a sack last year. And so that's a lot of the gripe that people have, but they take it too far against him. Like, my general take on him, you know, and we'll stop there so I can save more of this for, for our film study, but I think he is an above-average player. 
I think his pass rush is about average. I think it's made up for immensely just by the pure power that he has. And I think as a run defender, that he is above average. I think he is a positive for the team. Even though apparently PFF thinks he's like the worst run defender ever. For some reason. So that's kind of where I'm at on Trayvon Walker. We'll talk more about him later this week and should be fun to do so. But definitely a controversial topic uh, talking about Trayvon Walker. Now getting to some of our other guys on the defense. Tyson Campbell ended up going down with an injury at a point in this game. I have not heard anything else about it. If it's like a lingering thing or if he's going to play or if he's out for a few weeks. Maybe there's news out by the time I post this, but really haven't heard anything. But ultimately, there was a pretty big difference when he was in the game, when he wasn't in the game, because Tyree Kill obviously had a pretty good finish, right? Had the phenomenal 80-yard touchdown against Ronald Darby, was not Campbell on him, and that hurt this team. That was a crucial play in this game. But ultimately... You know, I I didn't see a ton of Tyson, but I thought he did fine. Obviously, only gave up 14 yards. That's pretty dang good compared to Ronald Darby's 111, of which you see 80 come from that play. But, um, you know, ultimately, decent day for Tyson Campbell. The rest of the guys got a little bit of concerns about because Ronald Darby, you know, solid day, especially in run defense, but he's not a guy who's going to be able to take on these top receivers and you know you talk about the safety room as well and I thought um, getting a Darnell Savage I think this is a little harsh for where his grade is I thought he did fine but Antonio Johnson had a really rough day as a tackler and coverage was not ideal for him I think he's obviously someone we're going to give some time because he's only become a starter very recently but One good thing about his game, obviously, run defense. That's where he was really good in college, and that was easily a positive on his draft profile for a lot of people. But kind of a rough day for those guys. See, Devon Hamilton's got a disgusting grade down here. I'm going to have to look into this, actually. I'm sure Andre Sisko probably got killed because of that touchdown, I would assume. But ultimately, you know, ignore these grades for a moment. This defense played really well. They were suffocating. They forced a lot of turnovers on downs. And ultimately, it was just some back-breaking plays that really hurt them. And some of the stuff, you're just not going to see these kinds of players again. You're not going to see Tyree Kill again until at most the playoffs. If you make it to the playoffs, and if they make it to the playoffs. Which, you know, Miami Dolphins are a little more likely after winning the game. But this was a good defensive performance. This was an easy, strong suit. For the team, the offense is really where things were questionable because this team moves the ball sometimes, and sometimes they just they can't do anything. But getting into like my overall notes here for the team, just to talk about that for a second, you know, we kind of mentioned this earlier. I'm a little concerned, just in general, with the passing volume of this offense. You know, Trevor Lawrence's entire career, it's never felt like he has gone out and just had these dominant, high-volume performances. We can go back and look at his games, you know, to kind of back this up. Obviously, you only have one this year, 162 yards, and most of that came from the first half. 2023, you know, we're, we're in the 200s, like, almost every week. Yeah, 315 here, 292. Like, there's some decent ones, you know, kind of in this later stretch as the team had to come from behind in a lot of games. But ultimately, like, that's been an area where it just doesn't feel like this team has been super impressive. And you saw it with the receiving totals. You saw it with the offense not doing anything in the second half. And for a team that specifically says, we want to be a pass-heavy offense, you know, I guess whether or not they say that, that's the way they act. They don't care about the run game a whole ton, at least not the run blocking. You know, for Trevor, he doesn't have the volume you'd expect of a player like that. And so I want to see him go out and put up these big performances. I want to see him go dominant. And I think he can do that with Brian Thomas Jr. I'm not like 
sitting here hating on Trevor Lawrence necessarily. I, I think he's got the capability, and I think he's he's got some people around him. There's clearly some issues, though, too, right? you got to worry about that offensive line. You want to see the rest of the receivers put it together because, I mean, my God. Like, you don't want drops, right? I almost thought it was nine drops for a second, so that's why I paused there. It was two. But this team has struggled with drops a lot. So you want to see that improve from Christian Kirk. You want to see him improve from the other guys too when it happens. But that's an area I think this team needs to improve. They were also very bad on third downs and ended up going 0 of 1 on fourth down. We all know which play that was. But third downs, you know, 2 of 10. I mean, just these crucial situations for this team where they cannot finish. It's frustrating to see that week after week after week, considering last season. As well, um, you know, we, we, we noted, obviously, the defense being really good, aside from the big Tyree Kill plays, the Jalen Waddle reception, of course. There were some explosive plays they gave up. Aside from that, really good game. But ultimately, this team, it just feels like right now where they're at and what they're going to have to get themselves out of is being this carbon copy of the 2023 season, right? Great start, promise, and then all of a sudden at the end, things just fall apart and no one wants to pull them out. One interview I'm always going to remember, I think it was from Josh Allen, he was talking about how at the end of last season, it felt like no one on the team was going to step up. Everyone was looking for someone else to go make the play cannot have that mentality right and there's specific players as well that's even worse for you know because i'm not going to look at a devon hamilton and be like yeah you're the problem man you're the one who's got to step up the most of everyone obviously you want him to but it's more so on guys like trevor lawrence like josh allen you know your your top players eventually it's going to be brian thomas jr i think sooner rather than later things are going to rely on him heavily you want to see this team step up in critical moments, and we have not seen it. It's more of that same bull crap from last year. It seems like they lack urgency. It, 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 they are seemingly just dead. When it's a critical situation, when the game's on the line, they're just dead. And it's crazy to say that, having gone to the wild card game in 2022, where this team, I, I guess technically 2023, but where this team went, and came back from 27 nothing, right? It felt like the opposite of what it is now. But this is where the Jaguars are, you know, forgetting just what's been, what is it like now, and this team is struggling. This team cannot finish games. This team will not step up in big moments. You know, there's just questionable decisions. There's decisions that I just don't understand. You know, why do you go up for it, fourth and one, deep in your territory, when you have all the momentum against you? One of the dumbest decisions I've seen from the staff. You know, and, and for Lawrence, like, my big question I wrote down after this game is, are we going to see the Trevor Lawrence of 2022 that stepped up in those big moments? It wasn't perfect, right? We're never going to expect perfection. But are we going to see that Trevor Lawrence? Or are we going to see the one that just kind of goes out and doesn't do it? You know, doesn't step up and nothing happens. Or are we going to sit here and say that this is the rest of the team? Is it is the offense so bad that nothing is there for Trevor Lawrence? I'm not saying this with an answer. I don't know right now. We got to see more of the season. But something is wrong, right? We should not be going into a game-winning drive without even being able to get a pass off. That should not happen. That's a big concern. Now, just a, a couple last things, you know, just to summarize this for me. Two major issues right now. And, and one I haven't really talked specifically about. But the lack of urgency and ability in the clutch is the biggest one, clearly. That has been a problem for this team for a while. They proved they were capable before, but they have definitely done the opposite recently. The other thing you kind of notice late if you look closer into the game, was this inability to just run the dang clock out. Like, when you do not care about getting players that are good at run blocking 
investing in that at all. You can't run down the clock to end the game. They weren't able to do that. You know, that is a critical component of this team. Whether or not showed a ton in this game, you know, I have concerns about that because Jacksonville did not just finish this game. They weren't able to just go down the field at the end and win it that way. They had to throw. They didn't have any other choice. The first time they ran, they got stuffed. They got stuffed quite a few plays before that as well. Those are major concerns for me. And, of course, with this offensive line, you know, keeping Trevor healthy. A lot of sacks, you know, not as bad as, as some other teams, but you don't want to see that. You don't want to see it from Anton Harrison either. You know, the guy who was supposed to be the cornerstone of this offensive line. It's a, that's a big problem. But, you know, I want to see this team learn. I, I want to quit hearing every week that, hey, this is a lesson for us to learn. Learn the damn lesson. And when you learn the lesson, you shouldn't have to learn it a second time. It seems like this team isn't capable of that right now. They got to prove us wrong. Now, games coming up, you know, there are some opportunities, but there's no doubt to me if the schedule is harder now than it's going to be, you know, a month from now. Because you've got games, I mean, we can look at the schedule here for Jacksonville, but next week against Cleveland at home, right? I mean, obviously we can laugh at Cleveland right now for having a terrible first week, but they also beat us last year with a backup, given that backup's probably better than Deshaun Watson. But this is a team that won in the trenches against Jacksonville. You may think they could be a pushover just because of the quarterback situation, but what happens if this offensive line crumbles again? What if we see another zero PFF grade for one of the players? Shout out Blake Hans. It's not going to be good. This team could very quickly be staring down 0-2, going into a road game against Buffalo, and then having to go on the road against Houston, which we're better on the road against them, to be fair. It's a critical game next week. It's one I think they're going to win. You know, for all the Debbie Downer that just sounded like, I do think they'll beat the Browns. I think they'll figure out a way. I think they have to. And, man, if they're trying to play with us anyway, they got to push it down the road. They got to make it at least close. They can't just, you know, lose four to start the season, right? But, like, I, I think Jacksonville will probably win that game. I think they've got to turn things around. I think they've got a better team. I think they'll be good enough in the trenches. Not great, but hopefully good enough to be able to win that. And then you got these big challenges, you know, on the road against the Bills, against the Texans. You got your free win at home. Uh, hopefully I didn't jinx that, but it's pretty hard to jinx that one, to be fair. And then going into London against the Bears and Patriots, you know, some easy games. And then play the Packers. See if Jordan loves in that game. That'll be a whole nother conversation for later. So it'll be interesting. I think right now, like where I sit with this team, well, I have compared to most fans, been a pessimist, of which I'm just trying to be a little more realistic because last year I predicted them to win the Super Bowl. Didn't even come close on that one. I'm not completely out on this team, right? I, I don't think the season's over. I don't think they're completely toast. You know, I have my opinions on whether or not they'll win a Super Bowl with this front office, but the season's not over. Things can turn around, and I think the key component of everything as far as just a player to watch got to get brian thomas jr the ball it's going to be a huge part of things i hope they plan for that i hope he has some big games because i think he is capable of it so that's all we got here i appreciate you guys joining for this um it's obviously something new haven't done a ton of game recaps in the past but uh hopefully we're doing a good job with this and you can give me your thoughts and let me know what you want to see from this channel We'll have a film breakdown later this week and maybe some other content. But that's all I've got. Hope you all have a great rest of your day. And finally, go Jags.